Part A. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a gynecologist talking to a patient called Mahira. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning Mahira. Please come in and take a seat. How are you feeling today? Good morning Dr. Cox. I've been feeling a bit uneasy lately. I've been experiencing some throbbing pain in the lower abdomen for the last few days, and I'm not sure. I see. It can sometimes be a concern during pregnancy. Let's go through your symptoms in detail. Doctor, it started as a dull ache, but lately, it's become more intense, especially when I'm walking or standing for long periods. It's quite uncomfortable, and I'm worried it could be affecting the baby. I've also noticed some swelling in my ankles and feet. Hmm, I understand. Do you experience any discomfort when lying down or resting? Not so much when I'm resting, but I'm constantly tired. And recently, I've started having difficulty breathing at times, especially in the evenings. All right, have you tried any treatments or remedies to alleviate the pain or swelling? Yes, I've been trying to rest more and elevate my feet, but it hasn't helped much. I've also taken some paracetamol, but I'm hesitant to take any stronger painkillers. I don't want to harm the baby. You're right. Have you noticed any other symptoms? Actually, I did have a pretty bad headache yesterday, but I thought it was just due to stress. As for the baby's movements, they seem to be normal, but sometimes I feel a bit anxious about whether the baby is okay. Oh, I've heard of that. Isn't it related to high blood pressure? Exactly. If left untreated, it can be dangerous for both you and the baby. That's why we'll need to run some tests to check your blood pressure and screen for proteinuria, which can be a sign of it. Okay, what kind of tests will I need to undergo? We'll start with a blood pressure check and a urine test to look for protein. I'll also recommend a blood test to check for liver and kidney function. Additionally, we'll need to perform an ultrasound scan to check on the baby's growth and amniotic fluid levels. If everything looks fine, we'll monitor you closely, but if we detect any signs of the condition, we'll need to take action immediately. What kind of treatment would I need? The primary treatment is managing your blood pressure. We might prescribe antihypertensive medication, nifedipine, which is safe to take during pregnancy. You would also need more frequent monitoring, this might mean coming in for checkups once a week or even more often if necessary. In some cases, if the condition worsens and it's too risky to continue the pregnancy, we may consider delivering the baby early, but that's a last resort. That sounds serious. Is there any risk to the baby with these medications or treatments? In severe cases, if early delivery is required, there's a risk of preterm birth. But at six months, we would aim to manage the condition until at least 34 weeks if possible. Babies born prematurely may need special care in a neonatal unit, but the prognosis is generally good with proper treatment and monitoring. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. You are. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a nurse talking to a patient called Mahira. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hi Mihira, I'm Nurse Robin Green. 
How can I assist you today? Uh, hi. Yes, um, thanks for seeing me. I'm just... I fell at home. Um, it was three days ago. I slipped into the kitchen. Landed pretty hard on my right knee, you know? It swelled up immediately, and, uh... I didn't think much of it at first, but now it's gotten worse. I mean, much worse. It's like a balloon or something. All right, so you had a fall, and how's the pain? Does it hurt when you move it? Oh, yes, it hurts. Um, it's like this sharp pain right in the front of the knee, and then it, it sort of throbs around the back. The front and back, uh, but mostly the front. And then sometimes, uh, I can't really bend it. But what's really strange is, um, it feels like, I don't know, like, it's clicking inside. I don't know the right word. Okay, I see. And this pain, does it get worse at certain times? Um, well, it's worse when I try to stand up, for sure. For example, if I've been sitting for a while, I can barely stand. It's almost like my knee just gives out, like, it can't support me. And, uh, going up the stairs is impossible. I have to hold on to the railing, and even then it's, um, painful. But it also aches when I'm just resting. We'll need to investigate. So, have you tried any treatments so far? Uh, well, I did the usual. I put ice on it the first day right after. You know, the RC thing, rest, ice, compression, elevation, but, um, I'm not sure if I did it right. I mean, I kept the ice on for, uh, about 20 minutes each time, maybe? But, um, it didn't really help. And I took some ibuprofen, but I can't really say if it's helping. Uh, maybe a little? I also, um, I've been using this cream, uh, I think it's a, Volterin. My friend gave it to me. But the swelling hasn't gone down at all. Okay, any other remedies or treatments you've tried? Uh, I also wrapped it in an elastic bandage. That was, um, on the second day. It felt a bit better at first, but then the knee, it, it felt too tight, you know? So I took it off. Oh, and I've been elevating it, but no real change, honestly. Given what you've described, I'd like to arrange an x-ray of the knee to check for any fractures or structural damage. Oh, do you think it could be a fracture? I, I really hope it's not something serious. It's hard to say without the tests, but the swelling, instability, and difficulty bearing weight could indicate a ligament injury. We'll know more after the x-ray. Uh, okay. Should I do something else in the meantime? For now, continue icing it a few times a day for about 15 to 20 minutes each time. Keep the knee elevated, and avoid putting too much pressure on it. We'll likely prescribe corticosteroids, depending on the results of your tests. All right. I'll do that. I just... I'm really worried. Hopefully, it's nothing too serious. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse called Mahira talking to a patient. Now read the question. Good morning. Are you ready for your flu shot? Let me quickly confirm a few details first. You're here for the seasonal flu vaccine, not the pneumonia shot, correct? Yes, Mihira, the flu shot. I had pneumonia last year, so it's not due for a while. Exactly. Now, I see you're allergic to penicillin. Have you had any reactions to vaccines in the past? Some people confuse flu shot side effects like mild soreness with allergic reactions. No, no allergies to vaccines. Just the penicillin thing, but the flu shot's always been fine. Great. And you're not feeling sick today, right? It's important that you're not running a fever. 
No fever, but I do have a bit of a cold. Is that an issue, Mihira? If it's just a mild cold without a fever, that's not a problem. The concern is when a patient has a higher fever, which could make the shot less effective. Okay, just relax your arm. This will be quick. Now look at question 26. You hear a doctor called Mihira discussing with a patient. Now read the question. So, let's talk about your injury. You mentioned pain in your right ankle, but I see here that last month you had a similar issue with your left ankle. Is that correct? Yes, Dr. Mihira, but this time it's the right one. The left one is better now after the physical therapy. Good to hear the therapy helped. Now, was this current injury caused the same way? You had mentioned a fall before, but here it says you were playing basketball this time. Right, last time I slipped in the shower. This time I twisted it while playing basketball. It wasn't as bad as before though. Got it. Since you're not experiencing any swelling like last time and your range of motion is better, we might not need to go through the same level of intensive therapy. That's a relief Dr. Mihira. So, no crutches this time. Exactly, just some rest, ice, and a lighter therapy plan. We'll still monitor it closely, though, especially because of your history of ankle issues. If there's any sign of the pain increasing, we'll reevaluate. Now look at question 27. You hear an ED nurse called Mahira talking to a patient's relative. Now read the question. I understand you're concerned about your brother's condition. He was brought in with chest pain, but we're still waiting on the results of the EKG and blood tests to determine if it's a heart attack or something less severe like angina. So, it might not be a heart attack. That's a relief. He's had chest pain before, but it wasn't this bad Mihira. It's hard to say right now. Chest pain can come from different causes, anything from a strained muscle to a panic attack, but we don't want to assume. We're monitoring him closely. He's stable, though, and his vitals are holding steady. Stable sounds good, but the doctors haven't ruled out a heart attack yet, right? Correct. We'll know more when the blood results come in. They're checking for cardiac enzymes, which will give us a clearer picture. Even if it's not a heart attack, we still need to keep a close watch for complications. So Mihira, even if it's not a heart attack, could still be serious? Yes, but right now, his condition is under control. We'll keep you updated as soon as we know more. Now look at question 28. You hear an occupational therapist called Mihira talking to a doctor. Now read the question. Good morning, Dr. Paul. I wanted to discuss our patient, Mrs. Thompson. She's been struggling with her fine motor skills since her stroke last month. Yes, Mihira, I noticed that during her last assessment. Have you considered how her left hemiparesis might impact her daily activities? Absolutely. It's affecting her ability to grip utensils, but I'm also concerned about her cognitive function. Sometimes she confuses her left and right sides, which complicates her therapy. Right and her vision issues could contribute as well. Do you think we should focus more on her mobility or her cognitive retraining? I believe a dual approach is essential. While improving her mobility is vital, addressing her cognitive confusion will help her regain confidence in using her affected hand. If we can work on both simultaneously, she may respond better overall.
That makes sense Mihira. Let's schedule her for therapy sessions that incorporate both aspects. Would you suggest a specific frequency for these sessions? I recommend twice a week initially, with the potential for more frequent sessions as she progresses. Now look at question 29. You hear a surgeon called Mahira talking to the team. Now read the question. Good morning, team. As we prepare for today's surgery on Mr. Anderson, I want to ensure we're all aligned on the procedure and potential complications. This is a complex case with a history of both diabetes and hypertension. Right, Mihira, and given his elevated blood pressure readings, we need to monitor his vitals closely throughout the procedure. Exactly. But I'm also concerned about his diabetes. It could affect his wound healing post-surgery. We need to discuss our approach to managing his blood glucose levels during the operation. Should we consider administering insulin before the surgery, or would that interfere with the anesthesia? That's a great question, James. Administering short-acting insulin before we start might actually stabilize his levels, but we'll have to time it carefully with the anesthesiologist. And what about the risk of infection? Should we increase our antibiotic prophylaxis Mihira? Yes, given his diabetes, we should certainly consider that as part of our preoperative protocol. Let's ensure we have the correct dosage ready. Now look at question 30. You hear a physician called Mahira talking to a pharmacist. Now read the question. Hi, Sarah. I wanted to discuss a few prescriptions for our patient, Mr. Lopez. He's currently on Adervastatin and Lisinopril, but I noticed his cholesterol levels haven't improved as we expected. Yes, Mihira, I've seen his profile. Are you thinking about switching the Adervastatin or perhaps adjusting the dosage? I'm considering an increase in the Adervastatin dose, but I'm also worried about possible interactions. He's been complaining about muscle pain, which could suggest statin-related myopathy. That's a valid concern. However, he might also be experiencing side effects from the lisinopril, especially since he's reported a persistent cough. Right, that's another issue to tackle. If we switch him to an alternative antihypertensive, such as losartan, it might alleviate the cough. That could help. So Mihira, are we planning to manage both the cholesterol and the hypertension in tandem? Absolutely. It's crucial to monitor his response closely after making these adjustments to ensure we address both issues effectively. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. You hear the conversation between a Dr. Mahira and an interviewer.
Dr. Mihira, thank you for joining us today. You've been in the news for your pioneering work in the field of ophthalmic surgery, particularly in eye replacement surgery. Could you start by giving us a brief insight into your work and the responsibilities it entails? Of course. My work as a leading ophthalmic surgeon is multifaceted, to say the least. At its core, my responsibility is to restore vision to patients whose sight has deteriorated due to trauma, disease, or congenital conditions. This includes everything from routine cataract surgeries to more experimental and intricate procedures like full eye replacements. Beyond the operating room, my responsibilities extend into research, overseeing patient trials, and collaborating with interdisciplinary teams to integrate new technologies. The goal is not just to perform surgeries, but to continuously push the boundaries of what we know in ophthalmology, ensuring that we're giving our patients the best possible outcomes. It sounds like you're involved in a lot of complex work. Speaking of pushing boundaries, what can you tell us about the latest advancements in eye replacement surgery? Dr. Mihira, this field seems to be evolving rapidly. Yes, you're right. The field is moving faster than ever. The most groundbreaking advancement in eye replacement surgery is the development of artificial biosynthetic eyes. These are not just prosthetic in nature, but integrate with the patient's existing optic nerves and retinal tissues. The technology relies on a hybrid of organic and synthetic materials that allow the eye to function in near-normal conditions. It's different from traditional approaches where we used only artificial structures. With this biosynthetic approach, we aim for patients to regain nearly 60 to 70% of their vision, which was unthinkable a decade ago. Another remarkable development is the use of stem cell technology to regenerate damaged retinal tissues. Combined with advancements in neural interfaces, we're able to simulate signal processing in the brain, which is key to making these procedures successful. That's fascinating, Dr. Mihira. I imagine that conducting such advanced surgeries requires significant resources. What are the main tools or resources you rely on to perform these surgeries? The resources we utilize are vast and span across multiple domains. First and foremost, the surgical technology itself has to be state-of-the-art. For instance, we use laser-assisted surgery tools, 3D imaging technologies, and robotic systems that allow for millimeter precision during surgeries. These are crucial in dealing with the sensitive structures of the eye. Beyond the physical tools, we also rely on data. Before any procedure, extensive pre-surgical simulations are done using AI models that predict how a patient's eye will respond to surgery. These predictive models are built from vast databases of previous surgeries and outcomes, enabling us to tailor the procedure to the individual. Additionally, we work closely with biochemical labs to ensure that the materials used for implants, such as biosynthetic cells or engineered tissues, are safe and biocompatible with the patient's unique physiology. With so many resources at your disposal, how do you ensure a high success rate, particularly with such experimental and cutting-edge techniques, Dr. Mihira? Ensuring success is about meticulous preparation and patient selection. First, we conduct exhaustive pre-surgical assessments that include everything from genetic tests to advanced imaging of the eye and brain. We want to know exactly what we're working with before we even enter the operating room. Additionally, post-surgical care is just as critical as the surgery itself. Patients are monitored intensively for several weeks after the procedure to catch any complications early on. Another factor is the team. Every surgery involves a cross-disciplinary team, neuroscientists, bioengineers, immunologists, and of course, ophthalmologists. Each team member ensures their respective area is addressed, whether it's ensuring that the optic nerve integration is working or making sure the immune system isn't rejecting the implant. Lastly, ongoing research and data collection helps us refine our techniques over time. It's a continuous learning process. It certainly sounds complex. Dr. Mihira, could you elaborate on just how complex these procedures are and what kind of challenges you face during surgery? The complexity cannot be overstated. First of all, the eye is an extremely delicate organ with countless tiny structures that are all interdependent. Replacing an entire eye or repairing significant damage involves understanding how all these structures interact. 
The real challenge is that we're not just restoring vision through mechanical means, but also trying to re-establish the brain-eye connection. The optic nerve, for instance, is notoriously difficult to regenerate or repair. Even when you successfully implant an artificial eye, if the brain doesn't recognize or properly process the signals, the surgery fails. Additionally, the surgery is incredibly time-sensitive. A patient's body can start rejecting the synthetic components hours or even minutes after surgery, which is why we need to work quickly and precisely. Immunosuppression is another challenge, as it carries risks of infection or other complications. It sounds like there are a lot of moving parts. With all these challenges, how well is your department prepared for patient trials? Given the complexity, Dr. Mihira, how do you ensure that the trials are safe and productive? Preparation is key. Our department has been gearing up for these trials for years, and we've taken every precaution to ensure that they're as safe and productive as possible. First, we have rigorous screening processes in place. Only patients who meet very specific criteria are allowed into the trial, ensuring that the candidates are the ones most likely to benefit from the surgery. We also make sure that they are fully aware of the experimental nature of the procedure, the risks involved, and the long-term follow-ups that will be necessary. Our clinical team is supported by a research wing that is dedicated to monitoring and adjusting the trial as needed, based on real-time data and patient feedback. Additionally, we have partnerships with external experts and institutions to peer-review our methods and protocols before they're applied. We're leaving no stone unturned to ensure the trials are not only successful, but also ethically sound. Now look at Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a nurse, Paul Ranger, talking about new patient care measures at Mahira Multispeciality Hospital. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues, staff members, and guests. As we gather today, it's my pleasure to introduce the latest advancements in patient care at Mahira Multispeciality Hospital. Over the past few months, significant changes have been implemented to elevate the standards of healthcare delivery. These changes, rooted in our ongoing mission to provide exceptional, holistic care, are aimed at ensuring patient well-being at every touchpoint within our hospital. I want to walk you through the essence of these changes, why they matter, and the profound impact they will have on both our patients and the medical team, including nurses like myself. Mahira Multispeciality Hospital stands as a beacon of modern medical practices combined with a patient-first philosophy. What truly sets Mahira apart is our commitment to multidisciplinary care. Patients benefit from a highly collaborative approach, where specialists from various fields come together to create personalized treatment plans. 
Whether it's cardiology, neurology, oncology, or orthopedics, we bring together the best minds in the industry under one roof. Furthermore, Mihira Multi-Speciality Hospital emphasizes the use of cutting-edge technology, making us pioneers in the implementation of AI-driven diagnostic tools and minimally invasive surgical techniques. Our reputation is built on a foundation of medical expertise, patient-centric approaches, and continuous innovation. However, it's not just our technological prowess or expert panels that make Mihira stand out. It is our deep-rooted culture of compassion, ensuring that every patient feels cared for, not just clinically treated. This dual focus on science and empathy forms the core of Mahira's specialty, creating a unique space where healing is approached holistically. Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital has recently introduced several key changes to enhance our patient care framework. These transformations, although operational at various levels, are strategically integrated to improve the overall healthcare experience. One of the most impactful changes is the introduction of personalized care pathways. Rather than adopting a one-size-fits-all treatment, we now tailor healthcare plans to meet the unique needs of each patient. This new system brings a level of precision medicine that was previously unattainable. Moreover, we've expanded our patient communication platforms. Patients can now track their treatment progress, medication schedules, and post-operative care remotely through our digital portal. This allows them to stay in direct contact with their healthcare providers, thus reducing unnecessary hospital visits. Additionally, the introduction of patient-centered rounds is a major shift. These rounds now involve patients, their families, and the healthcare team discussing the treatment plan together, fostering a transparent environment. These rounds also prioritize patient dignity and autonomy, allowing them to have a say in their care decisions. Lastly, we have revamped our nursing protocols to ensure continuous education and skills upgrading, which aligns with the hospital's overarching mission to stay ahead in medical practices and patient care. The changes implemented at Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital are not merely administrative or procedural. They are set to redefine how we perceive patient care altogether. With personalized care pathways, each patient receives treatment tailored to their medical history, genetic makeup, and individual needs. This precision reduces the risk of unnecessary procedures while increasing the likelihood of successful outcomes. Our expanded communication platforms make Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital more accessible to patients, even from the comfort of their homes. Remote monitoring tools ensure that patients can track their recovery without feeling isolated from the medical team, ultimately enhancing their satisfaction and emotional well-being. Furthermore, the new patient-centered rounds shift the power dynamic in healthcare, enabling patients and their families to play a more active role in the decision-making process. This improves trust and ensures that the care provided aligns with the patient's values and desires. From a nursing perspective, the updated protocols are expected to greatly enhance the quality of patient interaction. Nurses, armed with updated training and real-time feedback from the new digital tools, can provide more responsive, informed, and compassionate care. These changes at Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital, though ambitious, have all the makings of a successful transformation. First, the move towards personalized medicine is supported by recent trends in healthcare, showing improved outcomes in terms of both patient satisfaction and medical success. By integrating technology with human care, the likelihood of medical errors is also reduced significantly. Our digital platforms provide real-time updates, which ensures any deviations in a patient's condition are addressed promptly. More importantly, the emphasis on transparent communication and patient autonomy resonates with the growing demand for ethical, patient-first healthcare. As patients feel more involved, their adherence to treatment plans improves, leading to better long-term outcomes. The positive feedback from preliminary trials of these changes suggests that Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital is setting a new standard for excellence in the industry. From a nursing perspective, the changes have been largely welcomed. Nurses at Mahira Multi-Speciality Hospital play a critical role in patient care, and the shift towards patient-centered rounds and enhanced communication platforms enables us to work more closely with both patients and other healthcare professionals. 
The continuous learning opportunities provided by the new protocols also ensure that we remain at the forefront of our profession, fostering both personal and professional growth. While some adjustments were required during the transition, the majority of nurses feel that these changes give us the tools to provide better care. The technology reduces administrative burdens, allowing us to spend more time attending to patients. Moreover, the greater transparency in patient care plans makes our roles more collaborative and satisfying. While the changes at Mahira Multispeciality Hospital have been overwhelmingly positive, there are certain challenges that we must acknowledge. The new digital platforms, while highly efficient, have occasionally posed difficulties for patients who are less tech-savvy. Some older patients, for instance, may struggle to navigate the app or follow digital updates, which can affect the seamlessness of care. Additionally, with the increased involvement of patients and their families in care decisions, some healthcare professionals have noted that managing expectations becomes trickier. Balancing medical expertise with patient preferences can sometimes lead to tensions, especially in complex cases where the best medical course may conflict with a patient's wishes. Going forward, there may be a need for better educational tools for both patients and families to fully understand the implications of their choices. That is the end of your OET listening test. Now check the answers.